Yes, record. Great. Thanks, uh, Joyce. So we, we start uh, today's session by, by welcoming you, of course, uh, again uh, to this discussion series on the practice of mixed methods. Uh, this is a discussion series hosted by the Institute of uh, Advanced Studies of the University of Amsterdam and co-organized by Federica Russo, who is, uh, however, uh, not, uh, will not join us uh, today, unfortunately, uh, Lasse Herritz and uh, uh, myself. And this discussion series tries to set bridges uh, or the, between the natural, social, and humanistic sciences, and also between different epistemologies and methodologies that are found within them. Uh, this series is an open space for discussion to try to overcome disciplinary barriers and stimulate a healthy dialogue about how to communicate across and possibly integrate ontological, epistemological and methodological differences to pave the way for real multi-data, comparative, multi and mixed method research. So quite, quite an ambition plan, and uh, we thank you very much for, for being here today uh, and, and to, to, to try to build and, and expand with us uh, the, the room for and the meaning uh, for, uh, for a mixed method of research. Uh, in today's session, um, sorry, in the previous session, actually, I will uh, do a, a sort of uh, uh, recap. Um, in the previous sessions, we have discussed about uh, the qualitative nature of quantitative data and also about uh, the quantification of qualitative data. We have also, also um, discussed uh, about uh, what data are and how, how we construct them, and also what we can do in uh, uh, the practice of uh, um, empirical research and in particular mixed method of research when we deal with different amounts or volumes of data. So from one case study to small n to large n data sets until we reach uh, big data. And in today's session, we, we leave these questions about data uh, a bit on a side, but we will uh, possibly come back to them during the discussion. And we focus instead on how we think in research. So how, how do we construct our models and theories and possibly uh, more humbly uh, our analytical frameworks? Uh, this is a, re a relevant issue for, for mixed method research because uh, mixed method research uh, should allow for the combination of different uh, models of realities or different ways of thinking about uh, reality and, and how we, we, we build our theories. Uh, and to lay out the discussion today, we will refer to syntactic and semantic uh, structures of uh, scientific theories, which is a much broader debate in the philosophy of, of science. But uh, in a nutshell, it is a bit, uh, it, it overlaps to a certain degree with, with um, uh, more and more uh, uh, deductive and inductive way to uh, look at reality and build models. So uh, the syntactic view uh, structures theories in terms of premises, uh, through which a conclusion follows that can be uh, related to uh, reality, while the semantic view uh, looks for um, the meaning or construct models and also set theoretical model uh, and uh, um, um, tries to connect the meaning of, uh, of the model that we built. Um, so provided that in science we have different ways to present and construct theories and models, um, and that these ways often constitute uh, barriers for interdisciplinary dialogue and mixed method research. Uh, the, in this session today, we try to uh, discuss this, the question like, uh, do syntactic and semantic analytical structures, uh, how do they differently work in practice and empirical research? And to what degree can syntactic and semantic structures um, um, be compatible uh, or incompatible? And what does this entail for uh, mixed method research? So to try to reply uh, to these questions and others and then leave room for the discussion, we invited today John Green and Brian Castellani as panelists. I will uh, briefly introduce them um, before giving them the, the word. So John Green is a physicist uh, by training and is a full professor of policy science at the Department of Political Science at the University of Amsterdam. He's also um, co-director of the program group Transnational Configurations, Conflicts and Governance of the Amsterdam Institute of Social Science Research. 
The constant throughout his career has been an engaged fascination with the relationships between science, technology, society, and politics. And his research focuses on the design and governance of systemic innovations and societal transitions with due attention to the implied dynamics of power, trust, and legitimacy. Empirically, much of his work focuses on agri-food, healthcare, and sustainable cities. And we have uh, Brian Castellani, he performs uh, uh, different roles and here I will uh, uh, only mention some of them. Uh, Brian Castellani is uh, director of the Research Method Center at the University of Durham and co-director of the Wolfson Research Institute for Health and Wellbeing. Uh, besides being adjunct uh, professor uh, of psychiatry at the Northeastern Ohio Medical University. He's also a co-investigator for the Center of the uh, Evaluation of Complexity Across the Nexus and a fellow of the National Academy of Social Sciences. He's, uh, a tra he's trained as a public health sociologist, clinical psychologist and methodologist, and takes a transdisciplinary uh, approach to his work. His methodological focus is primar primarily on computational modeling and mixed methods. And together with his colleagues, uh, um, in the past 10 years, Brian has been developing new approaches and methods to modeling complex social systems and social complexity to help researchers, uh, policy evaluators, and public sector organizations address a variety of uh, uh, issues, for instance, from the depression to air pollution and brain health to the social determinants of health inequalities. So we have... Uh, um, very solid, experienced, uh, uh, and interdisciplinary uh, panelists today to, to, to reflect with uh, our, with us on, uh, um, on, the, on the differences and possible integration between syntactic and semantic structures. So I will, uh, I would give the word to uh, Brian or John. I don't know who wants to start first for the, the, your seven, more or less seven minute pitch. Who would you like to start? I propose you let our guests start. <laughs> So, Brian, you mean? Yes. Uh, <laughs> hi. <laughs> All right. Um, I, may I show just one slide? Is that okay to show one PowerPoint? Uh, yes, of course. Of course, of course. I think that you should be able to, uh, I mean, sharing is possible. Yeah. Okay, great. Can everybody see that? Oh, yes. Good. Okay. Yeah. Um, my arguments, um, simple enough, um, is basically when it comes, so, you know, thinking about the title for today, um, this idea of semantics versus syntactic structures, um, I would say, and um, Sophia and Lassa asked me to make some pro provocative points, so I thought, all right, let's enjoy a bit of discussion. So I'm going to make four provocations. Um, I well, five actually, if you take what I'm not interested in. And, and I take more of a Foucaultian perspective. It's not that it, this isn't important, it's just not interesting to me. Um, I'm in, less interested in the syntactic structures of methods and modeling absent of social context. I teach a, a module right now for our masters in data science and methods um, called interdisciplinary perspectives. And I approach methods and, and models from the perspective of you could have something like an agent-based model and an anthropologist, a physicist, a public health um, expert and a psychologist are gonna use that very tool in very different ways, depending upon the syntactic structures of the actual disciplines they're grounded in. So for me, one of the things that I would enjoy chatting about today is how do the syntactic structures of disciplines influence the meaning made with data regardless of even if it is this simple quantitative qualitative divide, it's still situated within different contexts. And uh, Lawson and I had been talking about this. I had a student in my in this module that I'm mentioning, and she's a, a, a ethnomethodologist, anthropologist. And I was explaining the complexity, or social complexity and all this sort of stuff and um, talking about qualitative inquiry and da 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 da. And she said, Still, from my perspective as an ethnomethod or as an um, anthropologist, ethnomethodologist, I still see you as very quantitative 
and computational. Um, and she felt that her approach was the better approach of the two for the sorts of work she was doing. And then I thought, well, see, even, even in the act of teaching this class, I'm still falling into the same traps myself. And so I think it's very difficult to get out of that. Um, the second uh, thing I would say is the syntactic structure of stakeholders versus academics. Because my work, um, and I'll be interested to in, you know, hear what you say too, John, given working with food security, as I think you were saying, or uh, food issues and um, related um, stuff is, um, when I'm working with people in the public sector, third se sector and communities, um, the ways in which they need information, how they meaning make um, that information versus the way I approach it, 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 uh, it really collide. And so if, if the theme of this is interdisciplinary methods, mixed methods, thinking about what sorts of methods people, you know, in their daily lives, my work being in air pollution and brain health, um, you know, around monitors, for example, how are monitors used um, as data collection devices for people living in communities with high levels of air pollution, both, um, both ambient and indoor. And those sensors for the most part are not particularly good. Um, and so what sorts of responses do they make um, to that? Um, and then also people living in communities with high levels of uh, air pollution who don't have any other choice um, so their responses to living in those environments would be different than someone, say, coming in from a leafy community, academic, and say, oh, you know, we need to clean up the school um, yard and green space and everything, but it's not a priority. So that sort of issue in terms of thinking about things. And then, um, given my grounding in complexity, it would also then be the syntactic structures of a complex versus reductionist approach. Again, it's the same methods. You could be doing statistics, but as a complexity scientist, I will use that statistical technique, say, even if it's some linear regression or a factor analysis, I'll use that in a very different way than my colleagues would um, who say come from a, a much more reductionist approach. And then also to make this distinction, we seem to conflate complexity and systems but I know a lot of people that do quote unquote complexity that do not actually think about systems. They build models that are still, they're computational. And um, a colleague of mine in the States, um, Scott Page had said, at some point it seems the complexities disappeared and it's just become computational modeling. Um, so again, even challenging back on those methods that tend to be thought of as complexity may still not actually be engaged in a systems perspective. So those would be things I would be um, keen on chatting about and talking about today. Great, thanks uh, a lot, Brian. You made it in uh, five minutes, which is probably the record <laughs> of uh, perfect uh, spot on timing. Um, and thank you for laying out um, the, the, the key uh, or your key um, clues or hints for, for discussion. So uh, how do different um, groups experience research like between stake, stakeholders and academics? Um, and and uh, uh, also if uh, um, complexity science um, sciences and a system thinking perspective could actually give a framework for mixed method research that makes sense in, in a way to bridge syntactic and uh, semantic approaches. Um, I would leave uh, uh, that on the floor and give the word to John. Thank you, Sophie. And thank you, Brian. That was an unexpected kinship. Um, I think I'm pretty close to your thinking, although I hope to add a few things by approaching it from a slightly different perspective. But still, I think there's many uh, uh, similarities. Um, in my remarks, I wish, like you did right in the first uh, lines of your slides, add a third notion to the well known duo of synthetic and semantic structures, and that is pragmatics. Yeah, or, if you prefer, I wish to point attention to the situatedness of syntax and semantics. More specifically, I'm a scholar who is primarily interested in systemic innovations. That in, these involve coherent sets of profound changes in practices, their relations, and their structural context. And part of what I'm doing is developing methods for policy analysis to support the design of such changes. 
for that, I need to be able to explore potentialities rather than merely assess current possibilities. And that includes providing empirically grounded and conceptually sound knowledge and insights into the ramifications of such options. Now I have come to understand over the years pretty deeply that in order to do so, it is crucial to avoid a particular fallacy. The fallacy that one rejects or even neglects such potentialities by applying current modes of, for instance, feasibility testing to, uh, in, your, in your design efforts. To avoid that risk, we need to pay attention to the situatedness of current concepts and methods in incumbent practices, and we need to find uh, methods and uh, data to find, assess, and elaborate alternatives. I will make this point on basis of two examples. Both examples uh, focus on the notion of efficiency. And I have been encountering that notion, for instance, in drafting two recent project proposal for exploring systemic innovations towards sustainability using complex adaptive system modeling in Polder, amongst other methods, yeah, in the, the EAS Polder project. Um, in many cases, the essence of projects for sustainability is that generic solutions are replaced by place-based solutions tailor-made to local context. Let me clarify that by using two examples. The first one involves the transition from an intensive agriculture to sustainable agriculture. In intensive agriculture, fertilizers and pesticides and so on are used to adapt local ecosystems to accommodate large scale, highly specialized farming, either crop monocultures or immense pig or chicken farms, both with a high pressure on the local environment. Sustainable alternatives to not adapt uh, local environment, to, but to draw up on local environments and to continuously re regenerate soil and water conditions that requires closing regional substance cycles by reintegration of crop and livestock production in a region with each other and with regional soil and water systems. So to a place-based solution. Yeah? The second example is the transition to non-fossil energy uh, systems. Fossil energy systems are typically universal networks that connect many decentral users with one central fossil producer. And the transition needs to go to networks that interconnect decentral consumers with diverse decentral producers and one or a few central producers. And local production will by definition, by nature be place-based. It will differ depending on the local availability of resources like space or, of, uh, space for wind turbines, subsoil aquifers for heat and cold storage, the possibilities in a particular neighborhood to insulate the buildings and so on. And that makes it essentially place-based. Yeah? So in sustainability often involves this shift from generic to place-based solutions and from functional differentiation to the integration of systems. In proactive policy analysis, time and again, one, one encounters the claim that these uh, systems cannot be as efficient as current solutions. Yet, there are examples where actors are making money while taking such solutions support. That has drawn my attention to exploring the concept of efficiency. <laughs> yes, yeah? so what is efficiency? Well, at first instance, the use of efficiency as a standard seems to be fairly justified if we look into its meaning. Just take standard dictionaries like Oxford, Merriam Webster, Longman, and so on, and they will all say something like efficiency is the state or quality of being efficient. And then they define being efficient as meaning, meaning eh, working productively with minimum wasted effort or expense. The problem is, however, that all these dictionaries immediately add a second, much more technical definition. The ratio of useful work performed by a machine or in a process to the total energy expended or heat taken in or the cost made or whatever. Yeah? And that second definition, of course, conflates, in fact, semantics with syntax. Yeah? 
And from discussions with actors involved in systemic innovations, it is clear that their objections are rooted in the same conflation. So efficiency then is a concept of which the semantic meaning has come to largely coincide, is being defined by its syntaxes. Hence, methods to calculate it are embedded in synthetic structures associated with that. If we closely look into the, these synthetic structures, they are associated with a particular type of context. Already the definitions in the, in the dictionary point to that is about one machine or one process. So the context is industrialization, modernity, functional differentiation, mass production, economies of scale. And in that sort of context, efficiency means what these dictionaries make it to mean. And indeed, place-based solutions can never be as efficient as large-scale universal solutions, because obviously their scale will be smaller. The question, of course, is whether we can have a broader understanding of efficiency and what it would entail. If you then look, for instance, into a well-known textbook in the field of policy analysis by Deborah Stone, you find indeed a more wider meaning of the concept. Namely, efficiency is not a call in, it, uh, in itself. It is not something we want for its own sake, but it helps us attain more of the things we value. Yeah, And that means that, for instance, integrating crop and animal production or integrating various sources of sustainable energy in a place-based way may indeed become efficient in this wider meaning of the world. But then of course we need a different syntax to analyze efficiency if we are not going to make the policy I was hinting at earlier. And that uh, is precisely what I'm currently working on, methods and concepts that can help us explore that sort of issues and even further going that also can help us find, identify options, potentialities that we would never find without uh, making sort of an inverse function of understanding efficiency. So look into a particular place and see where, how and how yeah, efficiency could be optimized, particularly there in that particular place. Well. What I'm doing to find these things is, on, is first contextualize current concepts and methods um, in the way I just did. So by historicizing them, by, uh, uh, by using then critical theory to say something about what's particular about that context, and then attempt to, after this deconstruction, to reconstruct such notions into methods and concepts that might be of more help for instance, by defining efficiency for situations of multiple value creation and synergy. I'm still on my way of identifying that and I'm looking forward to discussion that may be of some help in doing so. Thank you very much, uh, John, for this uh, interesting uh, pitch. Uh, I was uh, quite intrigued actually. I don't know, Brian, if you want to uh, react before we uh, open the floor um, to questions and possible comments from the other participants. Um, just, yeah, I just absolutely agree with what John's saying. And I would add that as the additional provocation is, is place. Uh, a lot of my work's around place, but um, definitely something, um, so the Durham Research Methods Center, we are actually, John, trying to do a curation of methods and a mapping similar to what you were talking about. So I don't know, Lawson and Sophia, there might be something there, maybe um, a visit to the Northeast of England uh, for everybody and, and maybe, you know, continue this discussion because I thought what John was saying was, was really brilliant, so. Could be a, that could be a nice exchange, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, 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 yeah, Lasse, do you want to add something? Yeah, I, I just like how we went from seminar to place of dating very quick. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, questions or remarks from the participants? Uh, just to see if there are uh, questions queuing. Otherwise, I will uh, provide some of my thoughts for what is worth. 
yes, I, do, I don't see uh, reactions so far uh, at the moment, so I will uh, um, just maybe uh, react to, to, to uh, what uh, John has said at the moment. Uh, I have to say that I really like this uh, focus on uh, um, situatedness, but on the other hand, um, uh, to me, situatedness is uh, um, just a way yeah, to put in context the um, a syntactic uh, approach. But on the, hand, on the other hand, it also uh, clashes with um, a certain type of uh, um, policy research or what we ask also for uh, to, um, to scientists working in uh, sustainability uh, and environmental assessment. Um, and my 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 um, my first remark is, what do we do with all this uh, place based uh, knowledge? I mean, it's absolutely I completely agree with you. But on the other hand, uh, shouldn't we look for the regularity? Because we know that science uh, is about regularity, is about universal laws. So how can we actually uh, then make sense of this fragmented knowledge that uh, place based uh, research uh, provides us? Um, and also another um, a point or another remark that I had is uh, um, you, you said that you, um, John, actually, that you uh, apply um, a, a critical perspective on uh, your research. Um, but how is this a situatedness? So the uh, focus on local and uh, context based knowledge related, for instance, to critical realism that uh, has been also uh, coming up uh, in the previous sessions. Then I would stop here. I, I would have another question, but maybe we can start from uh, these two uh, points of discussion for the moment. Yeah, thanks. These, of course, are really uh, central issues here um, and, and uh, worth uh, uh, more discussion probably that we can, hear, can have here. But indeed, situatedness may clash with policy research. Um, and um, that is indeed closely related to the idea that policy research has often been based on universally valid knowledge. Yeah, um, I think that is precisely the, the core and the heart of the problem. Um, universal knowledge, of course, has been with us since, uh, let's say, the 60th and the 70th century, the Newtonian paradigm yeah, that became dominant and became a model for all sorts of other science from biology to sociology. Um, and is about the sort of knowledge in which we can formulate universal causal laws. So if A occurs, then B will also occur through a mechanism we know. If, that also means if we know the state of a system at TS zero, we can also predict how it will look like at TS one and TS two. And the th two things together mean that we can control the system. Yeah. So it is control-oriented knowledge that we started to privilege some 350, 400 years ago. And precisely that is part of the problem of unsustainability. That is one of my claims of, um, of, my, of, of my part of my diagnosis of sustainability problems. They result from the fact that we have tried to control society and nature in a way to produce some form of welfare in a too narrow way, so to say. So we need precisely to move away from that control mode of thinking in order to overcome that sustainability. And in that sense, it's unavoidable that we do move away from this particular kind of universal laws, or maybe from this particular perspective on universal laws on how they should be used. Yeah? And that means that, for instance, we should learn better to work with local actors in local context, using, of course, more generic knowledge to see how we can work on this context, rather than impose a generic solution, yes, coming, coming from this control mode, and then control that local context in a way to accommodate our theory, so to say. Yes, so use the theory to understand local context and its potentialities, rather than the other way around. I think there is actually the solution, but I do agree that that will require a lot of also cultural change to appreciate that, and to give also the same sort of authority to that kind of knowledge. So I think it's a deep problem that you're, a, a deep lying problem that you have identified here. And let me brief it then on the second point about critical theory. Um, I think if you look into critical theory, then 
many of the points that have been made but in the form of social critique on established practices often puts its finger on the limits of these practices, like the sort of limits I just mentioned. Yeah? And that also means that they have point, put their fingers on the limits of our current understanding and on therefore also on opportunities where we may go, may go beyond that in order to do a better job. So some, some 10 years ago, a PhD student of mine, uh, Jack Jan Schuitmaker, developed a method for designing novel practices by looking from the perspective of critique into the barriers to innovations. And then you could understand these barriers in many cases as expressions of systemic flaws that had already been identified by, by criticists yeah, and now turn to be sort of the starting points for redefining practices. Yeah, and that's how I use critique. So it is to deconstruct, to critically deconstruct as a basis for reconstruction. Yes, so that we don't necessarily only destroy <laughs> what has been uh, there, but but indeed I think that uh, th there is still some uncertainty regarding how, how do we do with this, how do we integrate back uh, this this uh, uh, situated place based knowledge and and if or to what degree mixed methods can can actually be be a part of the solution. Um, I see uh, Judith and Brian. I don't know. I think that Judith was first uh, on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, I uh, was wondering about this this idea of of more of a local meaning of efficiency, uh, which is a, 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 a coincidence also uh, uh, for me because uh, I uh, migrated to Austria uh, six years ago. And uh, I think the most important or one of the most important differences between Austria and the Netherlands where, where I come from uh, is uh, this efficiency. And you can see it in, 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 many, in many things. Um, uh, but I was wondering whether if we uh, uh, look at local meanings of efficiency, whether we not only lose some possibilities of uh, critiquing um, uh, efficiency. And I think the pandemic uh, provides a good example um, because, uh, I mean, the, 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 the Dutch healthcare, healthcare system is much more um, efficient, uh, so to speak. Uh, had, Uh, they, they are able to, to sustain their, their Judith, we are losing you, I think. Uh, Is it better now? Uh, let, let's try again. Yes, it seems to work, but you, you were frozen. I think that you are frozen also now, so yeah. Um, still, still, it seems. Then we we can first switch to Brian and then Brian, save, uh, and then we we go back. Yes. Yeah. See if, if Austria allows uh, Judith back online. <laughs> no, she was yeah. saying things and they cut her line off. <laughs> yeah, it was very clear. This was very clear. I'm an American. I'm used to that paranoia. <laughs> I, um, yeah. So I just wanted to build off of what John was saying in response to what you said, Sophia. Uh, I would use the pandemic as an example of, I guess. Place-based for me is not the same as place-constrained. And so there's some universal insights that come out from public health folk like me around infectious disease. You know, you saw the model. So let's, let's quarantine, let's create social distancing, let's have people wear masks, let's get them vaccinated. So those are sort of like universal principles. We know they generally work, but let's take the last round of the, um, the last wave and you look at the Netherlands, the, the responding in that way was actually the wrong way to respond. By constraining the times that the trains drove around, put more people on them rather than spreading them out. Closing the grocery stores early, put more people in the grocery stores rather than letting them spread out across the day. Putting people in their families when the disease was primarily spreading amongst children and adolescents, um, was, was the wrong way to respond as opposed to putting them in school. And so these are like sort of universal truths that we have in public health, but without being place specific and, and place based, 
um, it doesn't lead to the to the to the results that we're looking for. And then there's all the knock-on effects that come from a, a specific form of efficiency or a specific form of sort of universal principles. A lot, a lot of my public health colleagues they don't understand political economy. They don't understand that for working people in the UK here to hear that you don't have to be quarantined anymore means they can go to work. For me, being privileged, it's it, it's you know for me it's like well hey I I'm gonna take first class train or something you know to avoid sitting amongst people but I can do that. So and I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, but it's an example of not understanding the context and the syntactic structures of the people and the places you're situated in, it makes those universal truths less useful often. Um, and, and that challenge, you know, and so, um, you know, if I'm working with private sector people there, just to stay with COVID, their, their notion of efficiency, right, is to be making money, to be um, keeping people um, in work. Um, whereas someone else may say efficiency is bringing the numbers of COVID cases down. Or someone else might say efficiency is providing the greatest amount of civil liberties and civil rights, irrespective of the impact it has on the commons. So for me, does that sort of answer the question is, I'm not disagreeing with universals, but it seems if, if you don't think methodologically in terms of these wider constraints, the methods and the semantic sort of meaning that comes from them, um, it, 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 the absence of that ground can, can lead to really, you know, not useful solutions. Yes, so if uh, I may paraphrase a bit what you said is that the uh, syntactic approach does not allow, sufficiently allow, or is not even geared towards recognizing differences that are there um, when we have uh, a more complex informed or anyway place-based approach, which in turn the semantic, uh, semantic structure in research could offer. So this, this uh, attention to diversity and uh, um, the importance or the relevance of context, is this more or less what you are? Yeah, I think in, in, in the other analogy, and I apologize to jump in, uh, but the, another analogy is clinical trials research, right? You know, clinical trials research is a universal, you know, the, uh, clinical, they all run the same way. But absence of context, when I teach medical students, I show them in the States, we have the physician desk reference manual. It's about that thick and it's made out of legal page. So it's that real thin onion page. And I show them the red marked corners of the book are about that thin, that's all the drugs. And then the rest of the book is the side effects, <laughs> right? And that's all absence of context. <laughs> so that's that's kind of my, um, my go-to for that kind of point. Thank you. Are there comments or questions from the part? Yeah, la, 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 se. yeah. I just leave your hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll speak today. So I, I want to continue on that on that topic, and I would like to pose this question primarily to Brian, but also to to John, about um, regarding uh, what is currently called case based modeling, which tries to walk that very thin line between case specific details and universals or generic patterns, whatever you may want to call that. And I would like to hear from, from, from both of you, to what extent case-based mod, case modeling is actually, in your views, uh, viable, is something that actually delivers pertinent uh, insights and not either insights that are too tailored to a specific context or those that are so generic that perhaps modeling was not needed in the first place. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I mean, so the, um, so there are multiple approaches in case-based, you know, the field of case-based analysis, you've got QCA, um, which I know Roland and some other people do, and you do Lhasa and you do Sofa, Sophia, um, and then you've got, say, maybe more quantitative approaches, um, and, you know, um, Benoit, uh, Liu, and others trying to sort of navigate all the, those sorts of differences. So I'll just speak to my particular approach. Um, for me, what the case does by calling a set of variables a case or a set of factors or conditions or causal elements, whatever you want it, however you variously describe it, is the case places it and situates it. And in the methods that I use, 
um, for example, around um, mostly artificial intelligence, topographical neural nets. What's nice about that approach is I can cluster, I can look for trends, I can, and I can have as many major and minor trends as I want because I'm not interested in the aggregate average for everything. So even if a, even if a trend only has three or five, that's cases out of a, out of a group of a thousand that's fine by me because if that's a drug reaction or that's then, then I do want to know about those three to five and, and lo and behold, that turns into something we're now called long COVID, right? So these minor trends that might get ignored become extremely important. In the act of say using a topographical neural net and that approach, at the same time, I never lose any individual case in my, my model. I've always got every case, I've got the trends, and then I can also back out, say, if you use differential equations or something like that, and look for aggregate dynamic patterns across all the trends, sort of like um, Hacken's notion of synergetics, where you're looking for these very high level aggregate emergent patterns, then down one level be, no, below that would be these trends, minor and major, and then below that would be individuals. Now that doesn't, that it sounds like I can do that, but a lot of times I can't. It's hard to actually do in, in, in reality, you know? I mean, so I, some of it kind of sounds a bit BS, but that's where I do at least attempt to go. Um, so I'm talking too much. I, I mean, at what, at what, what is your cutoff point for deciding whether something falls into the header of, you know, generic, perhaps universal patterns and what is still case specific? How do you decide? Do you, do you mind, John, if I just keep talking? Is that all? Yeah, then we, then we go to John. So John, we just bought him a couple of minutes more time to think about this. Okay, okay. Um, so um, my colleague Rajiv Rajaram and I, what we did was we, we, we use uh, an entropy approach to information theory, sort of entropy information theory. Um, and what we started plotting was diversity within complex systems. And what we found is, um, lots of systems cluster around a small number of trends that, that actually, you know, six, seven, eight, you know, uh, you know, if you think like, if you take a, a field and you look at the species of birds in it, you're not going to find a hundred different species. You're probably going to find maybe 10, 12 of which three or four will dominate, you know? So, so there's this tendency in nature and we see this in like six degrees of separation and, or actually scale-free networks, even though they don't follow a power law. So sorry, Barabasi, but um, even within the scale-free aspect that you are seeing hubs, nodes. So you are seeing these dominant um, positions within the system. And that makes it easy to sort of move up and down because you're not, you're not literally trying to take into account everything. Thanks, cheers. How about you, John? Yeah, let me, uh, given what Brian has already said, and which I really appreciate this being highly relevant, give a very different kind of answer. And that is what is actually the sort of knowledge we should be looking for in cases like we discuss here. Um, and that is, I think, sort of a repertoire of methods, concepts, which solutions. And the repertoire, he means a variety, so a catalog, plus uh, um, indeed an ID, an analytically accurate ID in which context which of the elements of the catalog might apply. Yeah? So a much better understanding of things that each of themselves transcend all sorts of different contexts, but are peculiarly fitting one particular type of context. What that means to say type of context is precisely what I mean in saying we need an analytical clue of relating these things to context, and then you get a repertoire of methods, concepts, solutions, and so on, eh, that, that can be tailored to specific context. I think that is as far as universal knowledge should try and get apart, of course, from a couple of universal causal laws about the behavior of electrons in particular context again. Yeah, and then, so then we are back. It is difficult to really say something is generic, except that we can explain in what context particular laws can be best understood. And when it then comes especially to social science or the social dimensions 
of, of, of uh, complex systems, it becomes important. Then I think that critical theory becomes particularly important, but also for the natural sciences. And think about Paul Illich and his limits of medicine, yeah? that did point from the viewpoint of social critique, his finger on particular flaws, also in the natural scientific parts of medicine and psychiatry. So that is indeed, uh, Sophia, an other way to approach the multi method question. Eh? Critical yes, analysis, exactly. discourse analysis, historicist analysis, all as ways that can help us in this endeavor, together with technical analysis, obviously. Yes, in, indeed, when uh, uh, finding a title for this series or trying to describe it, we, we, we uh, listed a number of uh, uh, characteristics that for us mixed method research in practice has. So multi-data, uh, comparative, but indeed uh, probably what uh, uh, the, the view that is emerging from this discussion is that it should also be place-based and that probably mixed methods uh, and comparative approaches uh, so oriented at identifying the diversity uh, across uh, different cases and observations. Uh, is precisely uh, the, the advantage that uh, this uh, a mixed method the research approach, which is also com complexity informed, which I'm not sure if you can uh, say also something about it. I mean, is this uh, um, is this place based uh, um, diversity oriented to uh, mention uh, uh, Regin's expression? Um, in mixed method research, necessarily complexity informed. So, does uh, so is a systemic perspective and a complexity informed perspective inherent to this approach, or do we have to add it on top or on the side? Or what's your view to it? Is uh, is it clear my question? No. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'll I, let John go first this time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but then, then I, the question is about is complexity inherent to? Yes. Or is it an additional layer? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, that that is that's an intriguing question. Yeah. Um, I attempt to say it is not inherent to it uh, because obviously also simpler problems of causation might indeed uh, have benefits from contextualizing our normal concepts method and so on. But having said so, if I take serious what I said earlier about the kind of problems that we are now often working on, then these are problems that take us away from a Newtonian logic to a different sort of logic in which context matters. And that by its nature will take us in many cases to a more complexity point of uh, complexity oriented uh, uh, view on, on issues. So maybe uh, the answer ultimately should be, well, it is in here, but I'm, I'm not, well, I'm, it's a good question. I will ponder about it further. <laughs> yeah. Um, Thanks, Ryan. Ryan. Yeah, so I would, yeah, I would say a, a complex, and that's sort of like part of the list I had there was that I totally agree with you, Sophia. I think, that it, 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 it is an actual different layer because again, I'm just gonna keep using the COVID stuff as an example since we're on that. I'm so place specific. I live in the countryside where I only see people once every three days because I live in the Isle of Skye in Scotland. Why do I wear a mask? Why do I bother getting vaccinated? Well, because if you don't, the, the disease continues to spread and mutate and somebody in India picks that up, and then we have a, we have the pandemic all over again. So you can become so place specific that if you are absent a complex systems understanding, then that's where I think place can become dangerous because you are you are bounded by a very limited understanding of of semantics, and so the systems perspective pushes people back to in my view a global awareness that understands that your place in the system is just that your place in the system and and these there's where network analysis and these sorts of i think techniques become very powerful you know like in obesity research looking at the way in which it's not just um you know birds of a feather flocking together it's not just homophily it's that actual people are impacting each other and i would say in the pandemic 
that's probably been the hardest thing to get across to people. Well, I don't wear a, wa a, mer wear a mask because I'm not worried about getting it. Yeah, but, <laughs> you know, my daughter works in a care home here and, you know, and, and so these elder elderly people, you know, are dying. And so she tries to come back to uni and explain to her friends why she's not going to the pub. And they're like, but they still go to the pub. So it's that's yeah, I'm kind of making the same point several times. Thank you, but I think it was uh, it was clear that yes, uh, the uh, it does not it, uh, that a complexity in foreign perspective is not necessarily in, inherent to this place based mixed method approach, uh, but it it will necessarily lead to a complexity thinking perspective, and uh, uh, then it can also link us back to a broader view. So yeah, to to relativize again or put in place again the place, <laughs> the specific uh, context. Um, other questions or remarks from the audience? Or, yeah, Lasse again, yes. <laughs> well, in lieu of other questions from other people, so I don't want to take all the space, but I, I would like to invite uh, Brian to return to one of the opening statements he made and uh, regarding the uh, syntactic structures of different disciplines. This is something that, that intrigues me. So I, I was wondering, Brian, if you could say a few things about those differences uh, from your own experience working in multidisciplinary teams almost all the time. What what have you experienced there? What are those differences? And can they, is there room to reconcile them? Is there, do, do the differences need to stay in place? What do you think? Um. I've had limited success in this area. <laughs> That's the way I'll, I'll say it. Um, uh, I, I find it really difficult because I think you're dealing with the way that the cognitive, I mean, to go to be almost, chomp, almost Chomsky about it is disciplines have structured our minds and our linguistic orientation so that even when we think we're on the same meaning, we're not. And, and that to me is a massive challenge around semantics. Um, you use a simple term like nonlinearity. When I talk to say somebody who's in um, humanities versus say somebody who's in physics, th those, that immediately in the brain goes to a whole different neural net pattern that, um, and, 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 and it's somewhere in the conversation you start realizing you're not, you're not in the same domain of the brain. And so I think Chomsky's point um, on that, that um, you can play the game of semantics, but without the syntactic structure in which it's grounded in, and that's sort of Wittgenstein too, you know, you, you don't have that. And I think disciplines are in a dangerous place right now because the world is not discipline, discipline bounded. And the problems that we're up against are not, uh, up against are not disciplinary bounded. And by the time students get to me at postgraduate level, it is really hard. I mean, it is really difficult. Um, their dissertations supervisors don't support it. Their departments don't support it. Uh, if they get degrees in it, it's hard to get work. They get stuck on the postdoctoral research associate. But I'm going to stop because Barry threw his hand up and I'm talking too much. But you get I totally get it. Yeah, yeah. We can look at to Barry's experiences too then. Yeah, just for, from my perspective, I, my field is uh, software engineering, and uh, there it's very much about mapping um, semantics to to syntax in a very very limiting way. Um, and the people uh, within that discipline, because it's mathematics, it's naturally redu reduction reductionist in the way that people are taught, and when they don't even realize what they're doing when they come out of university and go into the field, they don't realize that, this, that they're mapping semantics in a dangerous way a lot of the time that reduces the picture. And what I find, just to go back to the earlier conversation we had, is that introducing the complexity sciences to senior software engineers causes their, their brain to click and say, this is what we've been doing. This is, this is why this hurts all the time. And so it's a very, very useful uh, thing to do. And, and so as an addition, uh, it's an additional layer, definitely, because we don't teach it to them, but it should be you know, taught to them before data structures and algorithms and their lives would be much easier afterwards.
Yeah, to just to build off of that, if, yeah. if okay, um, we just, my colleague, Alexandra, um, Krista and myself, we just got an Alan Turing grant. It's a small grant, but it's to decolonize the algorithm. Um, looking at AI, just to what you're saying, Barry, how in which these, ontolo these ontologies, these, these computer science ontologies, how, how they construct the reality and, and it's biased and the people doing it don't even see it. But to your point, when you bring that awareness to them, like, oh, I mean, it's like, it's kind of like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> they get it. But until you do that, it, it's not there and it's not part of the curricular. Um... Yeah, so that we should bring some, some semantics and some meanings to the syntactic uh, uh, field in order to yeah to stimulate this dialogue across disciplines probably and this is something that indeed educational curricula are missing the fact that there are uh, um, once we are inside a certain education curriculum then it is difficult to uh, get uh, cross fertilization or influence from other uh, points of view and so this probably also hampers later on uh, uh, possibilities for mixed method research or uh, uh, interdisciplinary research. Um, yes, John, maybe we are almost uh, uh, closing the event. So, I, I, yeah, yes. I will really quick. I was struck by your wonderful um, remark that we need to bring some semantics uh, to syntax, huh? because again, the pandemic is a good illustration here. For instance, in the Netherlands, there was a debate about ventilation, whether or not it would help. The problem was that this was promoted by somebody who immediately drew the conclusion that social distancing and mask wearing would no longer be necessary once you would ventilate. And that was the reason that the Dutch Institute for Public Health rejected the claim that ventilation would help and later was blamed for overlooking an obvious possibility. But that shows how context gives meaning to particular concepts and how important it is to talk about that meaning rather than only about the syntax that led to particular conclusions. Yeah. And that I wanted to just mention as one example of how important it is what you just said, Sophia. Wonderful. I think it's uh, also a perfect way to close the session. Uh, I would say just to have that we, we go outside uh, with, with, uh, with the key message. <laughs> so to bring more, more semantic in the, in the syntactic. Um, I would like to thank the, uh, the panelists that uh, discussed with us, uh, that, that agreed to discuss with us these, uh, these topics also, so that uh, especially brought in a lot of their uh, experience and uh, uh, examples uh, in, uh, um, in about the differences, uh, in discussing about the differences between uh, uh, syntactic and semantics. And I also thanks a lot of the participants. Um, uh, I hope that the, you, you enjoyed the discussion as, as much as we did and that it will give you also some food for thought for, for uh, uh, yeah, more place-based complexity informed mixed method results. So it's becoming longer and longer the title. Thanks a lot again and uh, see you in two weeks um, for uh, the next session. Yeah, in two or weeks, we will, uh, in two weeks we will discuss on, on March 11th, we will discuss uh, causality. So we will solve all questions about causality in 60 minutes. I'm sure we will. <laughs> we have two, two new guest speakers there. We're really looking forward to welcome you in there. Um, so in, yes. yeah, and prepare your questions and all your comments. It would be great. Thank you. And uh, thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Good weekend. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.